you want to be uh, turning to read along with, I'm going to be in Psalm 93. Just going to look at the entire Psalm. Uh, it's only five verses, but it is a, it's one of my 150 favorite Psalms that there is. Those that know your Bible know there is 150 of them, so I, I, I like them all. But there are some I like more than, than others even, and this is for sure among them that there is a, there is a place that God draws us into that is a place of peace and rest, a place of abiding pleasure, a place of perceived safety and comfort, and, and I believe that, that this will definitely solidify that place, that destination, that place that we can, we should live there. We all know we should. But there, if we find ourselves just outside of it, it is the place that we retreat to. And it is the place where God reigns. And that's the way the the psalm begins. So we'll just read through it real quick as these five verses and then we'll, we'll dig in. It says, The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He girds himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice, the floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. Your testimonies are very sure. Holiness adorns your house, O oh Lord, forever. As we are peering in to yet another psalm. I mean, for, for years, uh, psalms were a steady diet for the, for the Sunday evening service. And for whatever reason, I rarely ever brought them to bear on Sunday morning worship, which looking back on that, it seems insane. So I'm, I'm glad that, that during this season, at least, we are getting back here more regularly. But when we look at this Psalm 93 and we see what the Lord is establishing through this psalmist who is unnamed, I mean, I immediately almost always try to attribute Psalms to David, but this one's unnamed, so we don't know who wrote this Psalm. We don't know what the exact occasion was, but this one is of a universal appeal. There is nothing more important for us as believers or just the, for us as human beings. There's nothing more important than solidifying in our hearts and minds that God reigns and then what that looks like. Because that's what this whole psalm descends from. Now, I could easily take those first three words and we could just go from Genesis to Revelation and just go through illustration after illustration because the entire word of God bears witness to this reality. This is what I would call an ultimate reality, it, that God reigns. And it is true that we can live in rebellion against God. We can bring ourselves into a situation to where we reject his rule. We despises commandments. I mean, actually it's the place that we're born into, the natural course of mankind would to be live out that rebellion that I was just talking about. But the reality is no matter how rebellious we are as individuals and no matter how rebellious the culture that we live in becomes, no matter how the whole world can be in complete rebellion against God, our God reigns. 
A picture of that comes from the Revelation where it, where it shows that Christ returns on a white horse with ten thousands of his saints and there was a sharp sword, it says, coming out of his mouth, which is symbolic language that shows the word coming out of his mouth was the weapon that he has with the word. And he goes forth and he brings into subjection all of the rebellion on planet Earth. That's because he reigns. That's not because he will come back someday and reign. That's because he reigns right now. He has that authority right now that every person you will talk to over the course of the next week lives under the authority of a God who reigns, who is infinite in his knowledge. He is infinite in his justice. He is infinite in his wisdom. He is infinite in his power. He is infinite in his holiness. He is altogether other than, and he has created everything that is, that, that's seen and unseen. It's all under his rule. He reigns. And his reign is majestic. When, when we think of the reign of God and, and we look at the world around us and we see so much chaos. I mean, it is crazy the amount of chaos that we see every evening. We turn on the news or at my house, the news gets turned on. And whenever that happens, it's just a litany of chaos. This chaos happened over here. This chaos went down in this city. There was something else here that went on with, with the government. There, there's something over here where there's this complete societal breakdown in some other place. And you might look at all of that and say, how is it that God reigns in the midst of all of this? Our God is infinite in all of his attributes, as we'd already stated there at the beginning. In his wisdom... I'm not questioning it. I don't understand it either. But in his wisdom, he chose to grant free will to mankind. Mankind gets to choose whether they're going to live a life in submission to his lordship or whether they're not. And that is part of the glory of his reign. Part of the majesty of his reign is, is that he does, that he gives space to people to come under his lordship voluntarily out of the free will of their own heart. Their, their desire to be volunteers, voluntary lovers of God. That, that's the desire of God's heart. God do, desires us to be in a place where we look at him and we find him and his reign, his rule, desirable. We see that he is the God who did not withhold his own son, but delivered him up for us all. So we can see that God is not holding out on us. Our first parents got it wrong. This is how deep this rolls into human nature. Our first parents, does God really reign? Does God really reign? Satan tempts our first parents, has God really said? that you will surely die. He just doesn't want you to be like him, knowing both good and evil. This was the temptation of our first parents. It was the temptation that, that doomed humanity to live in the, in the relative squalor that it does today. All of that curse that came with that first rebellion and has been descended down through the generations, that all descends out of that attitude that says, God is holding out on me. Why do people reject the reign of God? Why isn't everybody as thrilled with the reign, the ruling and reigning of God as me and you are? Why are there so many living in complete rebellion against him? They don't believe that he's good. It, it's universal. Every person, every person that lives in rebellion against God 
does so because they do not believe in his goodness. They may believe in his power. You, you look and you hear so many that are saying things like, well, if, if God really was love, if God was loving, he would not allow. And there's this whole list of things, the accusations against God. His reign is glorious. His reign is majestic. There is absolute majesty. He's clothed in majesty. He does all things well. Everything that he does, whether that is actively does, the things that he makes happen, or the things that he allows to happen, all of it, we will see in the end, was to his glory. It was the perfect action or inaction it was the exact thing that God was going to use to see the ultimate glorification of himself and the glorification of mankind because that's what we've been called into is to live life to the glory of God all that any of us are going to care about a hundred years from now I only see a couple of people that showed up here today that that might be an understatement so I'm going to go with 150. There's, there, there's a couple of two-year-olds around here that might live to be 102. So I'm going to take it out to 150. 150 years from now, I guarantee you none of us are going to care about anything except did we live our life to the glory of God because everything else passes away. I think, well, that, but I, I did all of these other things. But no, none of that's going to go with you it's only those things which are done for Christ that last he is clothed with majesty he is clothed he has girded himself with strength he established this authority on his own it says he has girded himself with strength is his own strength he is clothed with it in that we see him through the manifestation of his strength. When it says here we're cl he's clothed with majesty, we perceive God through the majestic nature of his activity. The way he rules shows to us his majesty. The way that he shows his strength reveals his power. What is probably the most universal declaration of the glory of God. In other words, the revelation of who God is. Another psalm states it very clearly, or may even be in, in Isaiah or both, but it says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament is handiwork. The creation. If there is a God who created all of this, this is the most amazing proof of both the power of God and the goodness of God, how, how creation has been ordered. Now, I, I know that it is long since fallen out of favor to talk about creation because our culture has completely got past that. That that, that is for the unsophisticated the, the undignified individuals who who are just the, the, the rubes that live out there in I guess Iuka or someplace like that that, that they're, those people are the ones who can buy into myths like creation everybody knows science has proven absolutely conclusively that all of this that we see just came to us through natural processes over billions of years and that's just the way the world works it's been established like that my reaction to statements like that is always says who says who well what what do you what do you make that statement based on well all the scientists agree well first of all not all the scientists do agree and second of all the Lord himself has made it so patently obvious. Not a single one of us can think about these things with any kind of certainty without 
going through a logical process. So everybody knows the process or the, the intellectual process of cause and effect. If we see something is being affected, we know that that effect has a cause. We see all the life around us. We know it has a cause. We don't disagree with our naturalist people that are in the majority of our culture. We don't disagree with them. It has a first cause. You just keep saying, why all the way back? How does this happen? Well, you only have to take and poke one hole somewhere in that chain. Every argument is only as strong as its weakest link. And when you go to linking back, I mean, evolution, uh, one of the most, and I wish I could remember his name off the top of my head, but I can't, um, but one of the major evolutionists was asked, what do you know for sure about evolution? And in a moment of candid honesty, he simply says, I know it probably shouldn't be taught in high school biology because he was seeing the foundations of it be shaken. I mean, I don't have to make the case to you. You, you believe that God created the heavens and the earth, that it was hit by his strength that he upholds everything. It's in him that we live and move and have our being. The, these things are established in our hearts, but the culture around us is starving to death. It is groping in darkness because they are not tethered to this truth that God reigns and that God is good. And how would they believe that if they've been told that there is nothing there's nothing out there that keeps all of this under control. That all of this, to the degree that there's any happiness at all, it's all one big happy accident. We have the good news. And the good news is our God reigns. He really does have all this chaotic mess under control. It is going inextricably straight to where he intends it to go. Its destiny is sure. He has spoken it beforehand and it will occur in the end. What he has declared, his coming, his establishment of a kingdom, his works in the world, these will be realized because God is God. And he cannot fail. He does not lie. He does everything that he does well and infinitely well at that. He goes on to establish what he did with that strength. And what he did with his strength was surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. There's no flaw in his work. Everything that he establishes I just have this gift of being able to hear objections to the things that I'm saying. Not yours, necessarily. I mean, you may, but uh, feel free, always. But when I hear myself say that, the objection that immediately comes to my mind, well, you just told us that our first parents fell. Or our first parents rejected the rule of God. How can he do all things well if he couldn't even keep the first two humans on the planet under subjection to him? It looks, he looks like more, he's more like the worst king ever than the best king ever. What we sometimes fail to realize, and we can even when we realize, have realized that we can fail to keep it in the front of our mind is Christ and his coming, it wasn't plan B after plan A failed. Now, I know that this can be a stretch that, that a perfect God would create a species on the planet, give them 
the, the higher uh, function of being able to reason, of being able to spiritually relate to him, of, of being able, being capable of true fellowship, heart to heart with him, and then knowing full well what they would do with their freedom, he would give them freedom anyway. If he is God, he did exactly that. He did not fail with our first parents. Ephesians talks about it in, in a very brief but pointed passage where it says that we, though those of us who have received the salvation that is in Christ, that we are to the praise of the glory of his grace. God in the desire of his heart desired for all of creation, for all of humanity, for every onlooking being in the immense number of, of angels and demons that are out there looking on at all of this that's being played out here on planet earth and whatever other kind of beings that God has created that perceive what's going on here on planet earth, God desired to show them what grace looked like. He desired to show them his goodness so that their, that his goodness wasn't just to be exhibited towards the good, but those who lived in abject rebellion against him, that he loved them enough to restore them. He loved them enough to maintain his complete justice. Not one sin goes unpunished. Every last sin that's ever been committed will be brought into account. Either that person will go on for eternity to pay for those sins and the punishments of hell, or that person's sin will have been purged, completely paid for in the person of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Our God reigns. And his perfect reign has been established so that his perfect justice could be maintained, yet we could be given a get out of hell free card. We could be given salvation. He could bestow forgiveness upon us and purge all of our sins and put us in a place of complete glory with him. He could do that. And everybody looking on, I think it's probably one of the reasons that he didn't extend that to come to mind immediately. And this is maybe more me just voicing a curiosity than it is, you know, something that might be meaningful to you, but the angels that fell, the ones we refer to as demons now because they rebelled against God. They were never extended a pathway back under the goodness of God. They were banished from the kingdom forever. So was God in any, was God at all compelled other than the counsel of his own will? Was God compelled with some necessity that he would redeem us, having created us and us going into rebellion? No, he created other beings and they went into rebellion and he did not bring them back. So a God who is love did not have to show his love to us in this way. It did not have to be, he did not have to do that for consistency's sake. He actually chose to do a different thing with us. The other reason that I think that the angels were not brought back under his lordship in, in that submissive sense, that, that he did not bring a plan of salvation to them, is they had sinned against more knowledge than that they've been in the spiritual presence of God in a way that Adam and Eve had not. Though they, in their innocence, they experienced fellowship with God. They had not, they'd not been in the heavenly realm. They had not been around his throne. They'd not seen the, the, the full glory of the one who had created them where the angels had um, just draw parenthesis around that and we'll move on. That part was, I guess, bonus and, and, and free, but God chose something different for us. Within his perfect reign, 
part of the majesty and the glory of, of God's reign was that he could take and give now at this time over 7 billion people the freedom to make their own choices and yet at the very same time be in complete control so as to move everything towards a destiny that he had determined in eternity past. Before ever there was a me or you, God had it in his heart, seeing the end from the beginning, knowing full well every choice and every result of every choice and every potential choice and the results of all those potential choices. And yet God could move those billions of, of chess pieces in such a way as to bring about that which he determined to be right and good and the end for which he created the universe, all the creation within it as far as life, plant, animal, human, all the other forms of life and spiritual dimensions, angels and demons and everything else that exists out there. He did all of that for the very purpose of revealing who he is. He desires to be known. He wants people, for whatever reason, known only to himself, he desires to be known. He doesn't just want to be feared and obeyed. He wants to be known. He wants to be enjoyed. He wants people that he created for the purpose of finding pleasure in him. This is the reality. He is such a good king that we are in a position where we should be the happiest people on planet earth. We should be filled with joy regardless of what our present circumstances are because we have a king that is above all. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and there is no one that compares to him and he is ours and we are his and his banner over us is love and it is for eternity. We are living in a reality that doesn't even get paused at the moment of death. It only gets intensified. Only things are, are left behind that will accelerate that which we desire all of our life, which is unfettered fellowship with the king. Our God reigns, and his reign is flawless. Verse 2. The throne, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Here the psalmist is speaking to God about the duration. Don't have a lot to say about this, but it is not unimportant. You know how I know it's not unimportant? It's in the Bible. And everything in the Bible is important. But this statement here, there was never a time when God did not reign. His, his reign is from of old and it is everlasting. It's from everlasting. It's a convoluted way of saying his reign is eternal. It never had a begin, beginning. God never learned to reign. He has always reigned over everything. It's by him that all things consist. So our God whom we serve, he doesn't have an expiration date. He always will be. And he doesn't have a best from date. He doesn't, he started. That would be a wrong statement. He never started. He's always been. You understand that, right? Do you? Because I don't. I, I, I don't have... And, you know, I just want to be sure. You know, we, I, I say stuff like that, and I know that it's true because it's obvious from Scripture. Verses like this state it directly. Do I understand that it's possible for there to be a being that no matter how far you go, I, I understand eternity future. It, it kind of lines up with my mind that no matter how far I go, there's always something just beyond that. If I live for a hundred years, there will be something a hundred and one years. If I live for a billion years, there will be a billion and one years. I, I get that. 
it's the other direction that poof, sorts out my brain. Everything that we know anything about other than God had a beginning. But he has always been. Um, that's what you're going to have to embrace. Uh, embrace the mystery. Because that's exactly what it is. It is a mystery. Um, I could blather on for 20 or 30 minutes till the lights go out in your eyes and um, you wouldn't know any more about it and, and I would just be proving my ignorance on the subject. So I will move on. These last three are, are going to go in, in pretty quick succession. Uh, the next two verses are grouped under, under one heading the way I, I view it here. It says, the floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. Uh, I really... I really love going to the ocean. Uh, we've had the occasion now over the last several years to take several vacations, spend it on the beach. And there's one word that, that always comes to mind. It's relentless. It's absolutely relentless. The, the action of the waves is relentless. They will come in, I mean, there, there's a storm, they'll come in huge, very uh, amazing to watch that, um, but on a perfectly calm day, the wave action is relentless. There's always waves, and they never stop, and nobody out there is controlling them. Nobody. But God. There's nobody. It, the, the waves are beyond the control, and that's why they get put in here. What he wants us to understand, what, what the psalmist is bringing us into contact with, is the power that's available there. You can manage in a boat on the sea in waves. You can manage as long as it's manageable. But nobody controls the waves. You may be able to control your own situation on the waves, but as the wave comes, you go up. And then when the wave passes, you go down and you get into swells that you can't see out of. Uh, first time I'd really ever been out on the ocean was this last year when we went on vacation. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. We went deep sea fishing, went 30 miles out, I think it was, out where you couldn't even see the high-rise condos on the, I mean, it was in the open ocean. And just talking about it probably isn't doing you any favors, but uh, you go up and you go down. I mean, it wasn't rough seas, but I was sitting there on the, on, on the little bench that went around the cabin and it was a pretty good sized boat, but there's rail, of course, around it. And I was watching and the waves would come up above the rail and then we'd go down and and, and we, we, we would go up and the waves would all be below the rail. And we were, we were in no danger of going under, but there was nothing the captain was doing that was affecting those waves. There is one in all of human history that stood up in a boat and said, peace, be still. That's the ultimate reality. I think these words right here was exactly what Jesus had in mind along with a lot of other things, but this right here, fulfilling this reality to be able to just bring it under his control, to not just say, when stop, but See, stop. Because wave action, I mean, it's one of the greatest potential sources of power that there is. Because they're relentless. They, they always are moving. There's such awesome power there because you know, every gallon of water that's being moved weighs eight pounds. So it's billions of 
pounds of thrust that's coming with wave action towards the shore. It's an amazing thing, yet it pales in comparison to the power of our God. God can control the uncontrollable. He proved it. He's proved it in that he calmed the storm. And he's also proved it in that he reigns over humanity and he will calm the storms of, re of, of humanity eventually. So he says this and then comes 1,500 years later in the person of Jesus Christ and he calms the waves and the seas physically. He does that. But there's a reality yet to be released where everything, the lion lays down with the lamb, a child shall lead them. All of this reality that God brings everything, not just under his rule and reign, because it's already there, but everything comes under his subjection. All things are brought under his feet, ultimately, is what Paul tells us in the New Testament. This reality will make it, it'll be an amazing calming of the sea of humanity. Everything will calm. The, the, it will be like a sea of glass. And that's why I believe that that, that revelation uh, vision is such a sea of glass. A sea like glass. A sea is perfectly sheen as glass. Stillness. Stillness is what the Lord will bring to the vastness of humanity when everything comes under submission to him. Right now, he's reigning over a storm. Uh, you might as well enjoy the ride. It's gonna be, it's gonna be ups and downs. You know, that, that's where we live. But there is a calm coming, and it will come to all that abide. So your testimonies are sh very sure. Not just sure, but very sure. Your testimonies are sure when God says a thing. It will come to pass. Everything that the Lord tells us, everything that he mentions out of his heart towards ours, you can go to the bank with it. You, you can go to eternity with it. You can stand upon it and test it. I, I'm going to use my oft-repeated illustration. Um, the, the, the one where the, the guy is going out across the frozen river. And, and he gets out there and he takes him a stick so he can kind of test and he pounds it. And he doesn't hear, it sounds solid, but he shuffles out a little farther, shuffles out a little farther and then he hears cracking. You know, of course it's a river, so it, it's moving a little bit in the warmth of the sun, so he hears a crack. So now he's laying flat out on his face and he's crawling just hoping now that he can make it to the other side. And then he knows it's all over because there's a rumbling. And he thinks it's going to break up. I'm going to be crushed between the ice. As we go downstream, this is going to be, it's not going to end well for him. And then about that time, a team of horses and a whole wagon of logs, sled of logs, go flying past him to the other side. And he's like, oh, well. And then he can get up and he can walk with absolute confidence because if it carried all of that weight, it will carry my weight. What the Lord is telling us here is you can stand upon my words. They are very sure. You stand upon the word of God. Nothing else will uphold you. What did Peter step out onto when Jesus had come to him on the storm, walking on the waves and Peter says, bring me out to you. He says, come, come to me. What was he, was, was Peter standing on water? No. Well, he said, no, of course not, not after he sunk. No, I'm saying when he was on top of the water, he was, got a secret for you. Humans can't walk on water. So Peter wasn't walking on water and neither was Jesus that they were walking they were standing upon the word 
of God. The power of Jesus' own word upheld him and the power of Jesus' words when he beckoned to Peter to come upheld him. You can stand upon the word of God and you need not fear. But since you, if you do, if you do avert your eyes from the one who upholds you, you will begin to sink. You will fall into fear. And he is faithful to reach down like he did to Peter and lift you back up and go back to the boat with you. That this is exactly what our God is all about. He is about establishing our trust in his words. His testimonies are very sure. And he re resides in the beauty of holiness. His holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever. What a reestablish a word that I created for our, our the benefit of our understanding and what holiness is, it's hisness. To be holy is to be his. You, you're not your own. You're bought with a price, with the precious blood of Jesus. You don't have control of your own life. Your, your life is not your own to use as you choose. Your life is his. Holiness is not how I cut my hair, the, the length of my shirt sleeves, or for you ladies, the length of your dresses, the, the height of your hair. It's none of that. Holiness is not an outward sign. Holiness is, are you his? Because if you are his, then, then you'll never be more his no matter what kind of, of trappings you add to the outside as symbols of your holiness. True holiness is an internal work and it is the reality of are you his? Because there's all sorts of religious people who have holy signals who are not his and therefore they are not holy. Some of the most holy people that I know would not be recognized as such by many of those who give the most lip service to holiness, but they're his, that they hold nothing back from him. That their, their yes is right there on the tip of their tongue. When God says to do it, they say yes. When God says to not do it, they say yes that they immediately respond and they do so with the purpose of expressing their hisness. So when you think of holiness, I want you to always think of hisness. I want you to think, am I his? Because every other definition of holiness will give you something to do. It says, you'll be holy if you do this, 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 and this. I mean, that was the Pharisees' approach to it. They, they were very factual about their approach to holiness. Well, I, I tithe even of my, my plants in the garden. I go out and pick every tenth leaf and, and give that away. I, I do this and I do that. I'll throw this one in too. Uh, there's a reason that we're called human beings. It's because that's what we are called to be, is a being, not a doing. We're not human doings, we're human beings. And God created us to be a being. And what you are being, are you being his? Is that the reality of your life? Not, not if you got me and every other person that you associate with convinced that you're holy. Does the Lord know that you're his? Because that's really all that matters. And it is with holiness that he adorns his house. This had a physical manifestation under the Old Testament in the temple. First, it was in the tabernacle, but then the temple. And there were some very ornate things that brought the knowledge and a physical manifestation to what the glory of God was to be looked for and looked like. But we are his house. We are a house being built up of living stones, a holy habitation for the Lord. We are the dwelling place of God. Those of us who have been called out of this world into submission to the king, once you're in the kingdom, he indwells you and all of those that have come to him in faith. And we are the temple of God. 
Paul was astounded at the Corinthians and he says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? That would be a relevant question within many of the body of Christ today. Do you not know that you're the temple of God, that God dwells in you by his spirit? Well, he inhabits those who are his. Therefore, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. You are a holy person. You are his, and he knows those who are his. Lord, I thank you for your word and the clarity that you bring to us and, and Lord, the glory of your rule and reign, not just over humanity, but over the entire universe, Lord, way beyond what, what even our technology can look out and see, Lord, the vastness of all that you've put your hand to, Lord. And, and God, we just thank you for calling us your own, Lord, for, for bringing us into a, a relationship with yourself that that we are upheld by the strength of your hand lord I, I know that i would have fallen away into destruction lord a, a million times over had it not been for your hand upholding me lord or your hand your strength establishing me in your kingdom lord i, I thank you that it doesn't depend upon upon me or upon us, Lord, but it, it, it's your power that we are taking comfort in, Lord, giving confidence to. So God, as we go from this place, Lord, we just pray that you will just grant us opportunity to be ambassadors, Lord, for your kingdom, God, that we will have opportunity to, to speak of the glory of your reign, Lord, that you will you give us words to share, Lord, with those who, who look upon us with curiosity. And, and Lord, want, want to know what makes us tick. Lord, we just pray, God, that you would give us a ready answer for all those that want to know about the hope that dwells within us. Lord, I just pray now that you'll go with us and that, Lord, you'll use us for your glory in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.